By the time Massive Attack released the 1998 record Mezzanine, Robert 3D Del Naya and Grant Daddy G Marshall and Andrew Mushroom Vowles had well established their place atop the UK music scene. Born of the DJ sound system scene in the late 1980s Bristol, Massive Attack combines the sampling and looping of electronica with a down-tempo brand of hip-hop to create what critics dub the trip-hop Bristol sound. It's marked by an ever-changing roster of lead vocalists like Sharon Nelson, Tracy Thorne and Martina Topley Bird, a trend Massive Attack began that's widely used in popular music today. The trio became a duo in 1999 when Andrew left the band over creative differences. And on album four, 3D went solo with Daddy G breaking to be with his family. But Massive Attack, the duo, is back with its first album together in 12 years called Heligoland. And now the Bristol Boys, 3D and Daddy G, are with me here in Studio Q. Hello, gentlemen. Can I just correct you on 12 years? Yes. Has it not been 12 years? No. How many years has it been? It's been seven since the last album. The, the last album with you two both on it? Yeah, to be honest, though, there's, it's, it's slightly mythological because, you know, we didn't actually not work on the record together. It just ended up, you know, being taken in, in a certain direction. Um, it was never intended to be a solo project. It never was. We, we never saw it as such. Um, we just had a, you know, various amount of disagreements on the approach, but it wasn't uh, an album we didn't work on together. It was a lot of time spent in the studio at the beginning of... Um, of uh, 100th window so all right well, uh, you know and plenty of time, plenty of time in between you know doing different things being on the road together so it's not like I, I know that people are trying to create this picture of us you know suddenly becoming you the know sort of uh, friends again after a 12 year gap but it's just not the way it is so you know? you've been in touch the entire time yeah absolutely gee what if it's been seven years what does it feel like to be back together after seven years with a new record and yeah, again, I'm contradicting what Dee's saying because uh, yeah, um, yeah, seven years. But you know, me and Dee have always been in contact with each other. From it was only just the studio time that we didn't spend together. So uh, you know, it was just that that time at the studio that we didn't. We weren't soul brothers. Well, what about when you did return to the studio together? Did it feel creatively different this time, or after a certain while, is it like riding a bicycle? No, it's always been creatively different. You know, we always strive to sort of not repeat the same formula of what we did last time. So every time we're in the studio, it's always a new experience and, uh, you know, it's new challenges. I'm conscious that you're drawing something. I'm curious. Just nerves. <laughs> <laughs> you're drawing your nerves? Yes. Are you, are you doing a caricature? No, nothing, no, nothing no. in particular. Oh, okay. I thought maybe you're... Doodling, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tony Bennett once uh, was here for an interview, and I, thought, I saw him doodling throughout the thing, and by the end of the interview, he had constructed a, a caricature of me and the entire studio. It was quite impressive. Well, I've got my little Transformer thing going on here, which I'll <laughs> stick together at the end of the right. interview. The, the new album does veer away uh, from strictly electronic music, if you guys could ever be considered only that. And, and there's a blend of acoustic instruments in this mix. You've talked about an organic sound on this record. Tell me about the reasons or... Or um, the precipitant of that shift. Do you like it? Do you know, I can't answer that. You, you, you can't answer that. You were in the studio. I wouldn't even listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the studio. Go on. What was the question again, sorry? The question. <laughs> the question was the organic sound. Oh yeah, that that was uh, well, that was just something that we we wanted to um to put across. You know, the fact that we've been, you know, we've evolved from. You know where we come from, from the studio base, the, from the DJ base thing to where we are now, and the fact that we were working with our musicians and uh, you know the nature of a hundredth window, we were trying to kind of get away from that sound, and uh, yeah, that that was that was the that was a goal we were trying to create something that was sort of more in keeping with you know you being in the studio with us as we were recording that sort of organic feel, so it was more of a you know. Immediate thing, really. A goal meaning it was a, like, is it a cerebral decision? Like, let's go in this d direction? Or d is it just a natural consequence of what you're feeling creatively? I think it was just a natural, you know, the way that, you know, we had approached it from the, from the original onset that we wanted to create that. Well, not necessarily, because, I mean, we did scrap a whole album in the oh process. Yeah, of course, yeah. So that's not a myth. That's not, no, that's not that, a myth. I that's mean. true. You've you written an entire album of songs. Well, there was there was a lot of material that we were we were kind of touring as well, and we curated a festival called Meltdown in London, which was like putting on your own sort of uh, private festival, effectively with your own bands, your own sort of like playlist, and we'd taken the sort of the gig on the on the road as well, 
uh, you know, on the back of that in the summer, and we were trying this material out, which was going to be this next album, which I think we got to the end of it. And, you know, I guess I particularly didn't really feel it at all. And didn't really sort of, I didn't have the, there was nothing for me it coming to the end of it. We, I went to the studio with it and tried to sort of capture it, what we've been doing on stage and didn't really feel, um, it just didn't have, the, it didn't have the heart for me. And so it was a case of starting again, you know, we, and one of the ideas was to go in with Damon Auburn, who's a friend of ours and change the environment, stu you know, in terms of getting out of Bristol, getting out of our own space and doing something a bit different, you know. And I think in terms of, you know, what uh, being 100 window was a very much a digital process, you know. It was probably the point where the computers caught up with us and b b everything was in the box, everything was everything was made in, in the, on the computer. And it was even though a lot of acoustic instru uh, instruments were used, they were all manipulated and changed and sort of uh, and affected on the computer. This record, I wanted it to be more, you know, more real. In a sense, when we got in with Damon, Damon's very much a spontaneous person, and you know that kind of rubbed off on us. And to be honest, in the studio with Damon was the first time me and G had probably sat in a room actually working together, writing in a traditional sense with you know a microphone out, all the lyrics on the table, um, you know Horace, Damon, keyboards, in a very much an almost an, uh, a sort of a traditional way. You've not recorded that way before. Not really that that sort of band. I mean, traditionally, you know we. It was a, you know, I mean, G's kind of got a more of a DJ approach. So he'll come in with ideas right. from tracks or he'll have ideas from bass lines and things, you know. But it's not like we sit down together going, okay, let's apply that with this and this with that. It's it's a more, it's a much more broken approach, you know, where people often work in their own spaces. I mean, Mushroom had his own studio at his house, you know, and he'd sit there in his own studio doing this thing. And, you know, at one point I was working with Tricky in a completely different studio and so on, you know. So does it seem more creatively united doing it this way? There's this moment, I feel, you know, the, the you're more of a football team. You're, you know, you're in there together. I think, you know, you. I think being on the road kind of defines the relationship now. You know, because we spend a lot of time in each other's company in that in that sense, and you're playing music to people in a more, uh, you know, sort of instantaneous manner. You're not in the studio locked away doing it for the future. This it's all happening now, and I think that kind of is what rubs off on the relationship. Uh, you know, there's no. We have to uh, matter years. Me and G are working that we're going to sit in the same room together, you know, scribbling lyrics and writing, you know, in, a, in that sort of fashion. That's not how it works, you know. We definitely, you know, I kind of tend to work in my space and, and likewise with G. But we've got a communal space in Bristol, and you know, it'd be great if, you know, there is a bit more of that spirit. But often we're, we're defined by the collaborations and the people we work with, you know. I want to get to that, but just to, what what were the uh, if there were any the emotional, if not economic. Um, implications of scrapping a whole record did you feel the, the pressure of doing that i think you know the, the, the first conversation with our manager was probably the most interesting <laughs> <laughs> how did that go that was you know i mean it happened didn't happen you know again i could romanticize it and make it sound like it was one moment but it was probably a period a series of conversations in which he suddenly he came to the conclusion that that was going to happen you know over a couple of weeks that this album was not going to be made as it was and i suppose it was strange for the record company and our our you know the guys who promote our gigs because they'd seen what they thought was an album and heard it and liked it and the news that it was not going to ever exist was a bit of a shock and also to be fair on the, some of the people we worked with on on those tracks uh, you know i felt there was definitely a bit of um residual guilt and, and and a little bit of loss in the sense of some of these tracks we weren't going to appear you know so there's lots of different emotional stuff that had to be you know sorted out as it wasn't just a simple decision you know i think the creative decision was very quick but the process of, of actually stopping that, that album happening and starting a new one was quite difficult, you know. I would imagine so. Tell me about the song Splitting the Atom from the new record. What's the story behind that one? Uh, I guess this was the f one of the things that happened in, in with Damon, you know, it was a very spontaneous moment. Um, uh, there was, you know, G, G had this kind of beat idea. Damon had a, a sort of like a, he called it an Arabic blues scale. <laughs> And I had all these lyrics, which were kind of about this, you know, the state of the, the state of the nation in the UK, the state of being for the individual who was watching, you know, time in history repeat itself. And the song kind of was born, really, you know. And that's how we we sort of threw it together. We chucked the lyrics, it made a sketch, and then and then start to refine it from that point onwards. Watching history history repeat itself, how so? In a sense that you could see that um, I think with the, the recession up upon us again, with the political uh, system in, in the UK feeling fragmented, 
with the disillusionment with the parties and the leaders, the same similar sorts of problems that were happening in the eighties, and you know, which was when we grew up as kids when we were into music. Right. And in a sense, we released our first album in in a in a, in a sort of a conservative government Britain, after a, a long period of Thatcherism, as we called it. Um, it felt like we were heading back towards this because we'd had this idealistic moment of the Labour Party coming to power and then that had all gone tits up when they agreed to go in, into Iraq and the recession that followed it after years of uh, not regulating the banks and the spending and you could see it all going on and we just felt like we were part of this this, this high court that you, know, you can't do anything about this thing. And know? all that is explored in this song. I think lots of, the, lots of parts of that but particularly the mood of that. Interesting. You know, the... the you this you talk about the, the that the, the genesis of that song the ideas behind that song um, seeing you live it's quite clear that there's politics behind the band um, even activism um, it's not something that one necessarily associates with this type of music with dance music with electro music with DJ music is that a prejudice or 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 do you know, do you know what I'm talking about I think that's a uh, probably a fair a fair assessment. I think there's been probably quite a lack of um, social political activity in the dance music scene for years. You know, there's been there's been a fair amount of posturing. You know, and there's been some good bands that do posturing well, but <laughs> not you know not any really serious kind of uh, intent. I think. Um, and and to be honest, in, I think that you probably some people would say that that goes right through the whole of the music scene in general. That there's very little. Um, will to sort of be to get involved in real real politics would it be fair issues. to say that this is a more political record than you've done in the past yes and no i mean the blue lines was very much i think people felt it reflected a period of time we'd come from you know in britain as well it was more of a it was more of a less of a political statement than a, a <coughs> an image of the social environment you know of bristol of london of england the, the, the sort of characters and the people that made up that landscape you know and i think people related to that a lot when, when we came out, even though we were entering the, the 90s, which was a kind of relatively blissful period of, you know, of hedonism and, and, and upbeatness in general, you know. Take, take me back to Blue Lines for just a moment, because uh, it, it reflected the sounds you pioneered in Bristol, but it was pretty something pretty new to the rest of the UK. How did you expect that more internal, pensive kind of dance music would go over when it was first released? We didn't know how it would go over in the studio when we were mixing it. I mean, we we didn't even know if we'd finish it, to be honest. Uh, I think, you know, there was, I could quite safely say that out of our camp, including Cameron, our then manager, and Johnny Duller, sadly our producer, who passed away last year, I don't think any of us, including them, actually knew if we'd finished the project. It was kind of very much uh, touch and go. So we had no idea, really, of whether it was going to work outside of the, the four walls we were occupying, you know. Now how did you, Daddy G? Uh, I think there was a there was a sense that there was something different that we were creating, most definitely, you know, because at the time, you know, as Dee was saying, dance music was kind of this high octane type of music, which was kind of a hedonism, sort of escapism, you know. And uh, with the music that we were making, it was more of a case of like, you know, maybe this is the type of music for uh, after the club, after mm. you know, you've completely come home and you off your head and you wanted to relax and, you know. Let your head do the t let your head do the, the dancing rather than your feet. You were surprised that it became both a phenomenon and critically praised. Not necessarily, to, to be honest. Me personally, because at the time I, you know, I was still quite heavily into DJing, and uh, you know, it, it, to me, it just seemed like there was something quite special going on in the studio between us, you know, and uh, you know, it was kind of the antithesis of what was, you know, going on at the time, really. You know, music-wise. Uh, tell me about, uh, it's interesting, both because of your success and because of your longevity, that despite the buzz you've had over the years and the early buzz, you've sometimes expressed the feeling that you self-identify as musical outsiders, that you d didn't really fit in with the traditional musicians or with dance DJs either. Tell me about that. I explore that feeling, if you will. Absolutely. I mean, you know, <coughs> we, I mean, I think because we came from this, this really, you know, exciting period of music where Bristol was a, uh, you know, it was about it was about small gigs and punk and everything, and it changed when we started doing these these sound system parties, and it became all about going to warehouse parties and and club nights instead of gigs, which then that evolved into the rave culture of the UK at the time. But That's right, yeah. you know, we were, I think we never we felt like we had we our history encompassed all these different scenes we'd been about, and which were really affecting for us. You know, I think hip hop was the 
to us was a mirror of the punk movement. It was this new identity of anti-establishment of something which was independent from the mainstream, which we were really into, you know. But when it came to putting our music out traditionally, we felt that we never fitted into either any any of the sort of like footprints that everyone else was sort of, you know, were treading well because we weren't doing what the DJs wanted to play on Saturday night, you know. We weren't playing stuff that could go on the radio. We weren't the darlings of the, the British indie rock press because we weren't doing that either. So we sort of sort of sort of trickled into the gaps and people had to find find us in a different way. And I think it was kind of suited us because we weren't pushing ourselves in people's faces, you know. Well, I wonder, uh, in almost a counterintuitive way, if if not fitting in, if feeling like outsiders can be liberating, it means there's you don't you don't have expectations. You do what you want. Yes, it's, it's totally liberating for us. You know, like like D said, we're not archetypal musicians, and uh, you know, in fact, you know, we're we're actually coming from the musical fan perspective. You know, where we've you know grew up with all these different genres of music, and uh, you know, when we got our chance to go into the studio through, you know, the the, the aesthetics of hip hop. You know, we kind of copied that sort of way of producing our music at first. You know, that that was the that was our inroads really from from that perspective, rather than from you know being the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> so, would the outsider status and the self identity of such be one of the reasons for the changes in musical directions or fa the facility to do, to do that? Well, there's no boundaries for what we do. So, you know, the music musical experiment was just that was what what we did. We just got into the studio. And, just experimented all the time, you know. Really? <laughs> to a certain extent, yeah. Or oh, chanced our hand. I like it when or you two disagree case. on the history of the band. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we do, because, I mean, I mean, because if you, you've imagined, there's the reason the band sort of fell apart, I guess, in, in the end of the, the night is was because we did disagree with direction. Now, if there had been three people that were totally open to experimentation, then that would never have happened, you know. We'd have all gone, yeah, everything goes, let's try everything. But there was always conflict because everyone came from their own taste background, their own style background, the things they adhered to. You know, Mushroom wasn't really into what we were doing on Blue Line, on, on, on Mezzanine, you know, at all. Um, you know, to a certain extent, me and G fight all the time because G's coming from a DJ background. He has things that he likes, that he feels from a groove point of view work. And I'm sort of always more likely to rip that up and try something. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I suppose I'm very, I'm always, I'm always pretty dissatisfied with what we do anyway. <laughs> That's why a lot of it goes back on the shelf or disappears into the, into the trash. But, you know, from an outsider's pers perspective, looking at you guys, it, it's, there's almost a massive attack paradox. Because on the one hand, if you say massive attack to a lot of people who, are, who know your music, there's, there's a, immediately there's a sound in mind. People identify you with a sound. And yet your, your music is constantly evolving. So what do you think it is that weaves together the massive at attack identity? Musically, it's, it's hard to say because when, you know when we've not worked together, you know when we've worked apart, you know there's still happen. It happens of into a space which I guess it carries with it its own history. Even when you're trying to you know push or pull away from what you're doing the, in the past, you maybe you can't escape some of it, and it's always there with you because your taste defines how you finish the track. You know, so whether it is doing something like Live with Me with Terry Callier, when, which you know I did with Neil, it still couldn't help but being Massive Attack esque, and it's in its history because it carried something from the past but it into into the present you know um on the other side of that 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 single there's false flags which was completely different it was a but the only constants are you two right i mean so is that the alchemy that that creates uh, this alchemy. this mm. <laughs> the musical alchemy g um uh, there's still something yeah deep deep down there's something about the aesthetic maybe that myself and d get out of the track, which is kind of quite similar. You know, yeah. in the end, there's, you know, you know, for instance, like Dee was saying, you know, we shared the same spirit in the studio this time making this album, whereas, you know, we weren't necessarily eating out of each other's pockets, but, you know, and, and, and there's, you know, a point where, you know, I think we're both kind of, you know, as much as we fought against the tracks, we're kind of quite happy that where the tracks are, where they sit now, we're, you know, we look at this body of work and, you know, it, it does reflect you know, Dee D and myself, you know, to a certain extent. Although, like, you know, our fingerprints aren't necessarily firmly on each track. I think, mm. I think the thing is, is, is like, you know, going back to that thing, it's happy to coexist, you know. there's You get to a point in, in the evolution of a, of a friendship or in a band where, you know, you're starting, it's all exciting, there's fights, you know, then the second record comes and 
you've suddenly got to compromise with each other because you've got to coexist on a different level. And then, you know, with us, with Mezzanine, we pushed everything to a different space and that created more fights and, and so on and so on, you know. But I think for, for me and G, you know, we've been, like I said, touring for so long that we've experienced our music and its effect on people or its effect on us in a completely different way, which isn't about the studio, it's about being out there, meeting people, playing to people and sharing that experience. And I think that really is what keeps the friendship is, is a definition. When we take that back to the studio, you know, the spirit is shared because of that, that, that memory we've had of doing this stuff together, you know, and it overrides all the conflicts of the past because you get to a certain age and you think, man, you know, we've been doing this now for over 20 years and that's more important than the fight over this track, you know, whereas mm -hmm. before the fight over that moment in the track could be right. the, the only thing that mattered. Before I let you go, let me just ask you about uh, the one thing that does remain consistent, which is uh, the idea, uh, an idea that you pioneered, in fact, of having guest vocalists on, on your tracks. And I, I, I wonder if that rotating front line, what that allows you to do creatively that bands with a steady front person cannot. That's something we're always into. I mean, G I mean, mentioned the Beatles earlier, you know, for instance, I mean, you know, we grew up with them, you know, my mum used to dance me around the room to that, and the Beatles were like that, you know, there was different vocalists, different songs. Then you can go to talk about The Clash, you know, and another sort of more traditional group setup sense again, that they'd switch vocalists all the time and bring in guest vocalists like Mikey Dread or Future 2000. And then, of course, there's the reggae, rap, hip-hop thing, which you might have the same grooves and different vocalists coming out and, and, and putting new songs on the same bass lines. So we were always intrigued by the fact that you didn't have to have a set person to sort of convey a message that it could always change. And that's, that's something that we took into the studio from the very, the, from day one, I think. And it's something that really intrigued us, and I guess it has helped us to redefine every time we start again with someone, we're all starting again in a new place. And we learn as much from the people that come into the studio as, as they do from our process, you know. 22 years, where, where do you guys, are you where you want to be? Where do you feel like you are on your journey? Um, and what, in terms of your aspirations for a massive attack in, 2010 and beyond. Um, well, I'm halfway home. <laughs> um, how, how many? How long is it? I think we're still trying to understand each other after all these years, and uh, you know, it's, it's for us, it's kind of exciting, and you know, and it's well, it's great to have achieved so little in such a long <laughs> space <laughs> of time. On. Come on. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's good. Still good. Thanks very much, guys. Pleasure to have you here. Okay, say that. Cheers. Robert 3D Del Naya and Grant Daddy G Marshall are the quintessential Bristol band Massive Attack. Their new album is called Heligoland. It's out now. And Massive Attack have been with me here live in Studio Q.